Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Modus GI Holdings, Inc. First Quarter 2020 Financial and Operational Update. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. There will be a presentation by the Modus Management Team, followed by a question and answer session. I must advise you all that today's conference is being recorded. I'd like to turn the call over to Bob Yedid of LifeSci Advisors. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Operator, and thank you, everyone, for joining us for the Modus GI First Quarter 2020 update call today. Representing the company are Tim Moran, Chief Executive Officer, Andrew Taylor, Chief Financial Officer, and Mark Pomerantz, President and Chief Operating Officer of Modus GI. Before turning the call over to management for their opening remarks, I'd like to take a minute to remind you that this conference call and webcast will contain forward-looking statements about the company. These statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ. Please note that these forward-looking statements reflect our opinions only as of the date of this call. We will not undertake an obligation to revise or publicly re release the results of any revisions to these forward-looking statements in light of new information or future events. Factors that can cause, that could cause, actual results or outcomes to differ materially from those expressed in or implied by such forward-looking statements are discussed in greater detail in our most recent filings on Form 10-K and our other periodic report, reports on Forms 10-Q and 8-K filed with the SEC. With those prepared remarks, I'd like to now turn the call over to Tim Moran, CEO of Modus GI. Tim? Thank you, Bob, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Q1 2020 earnings call. I would like to start by providing a business update before turning the call over to Andrew to review our financial results for the first quarter. At the end of our prepared remarks, we will open the call for a Q&A session. I'd like to cover three key topics today. Provide an update on our launch progress through the first quarter, share our view of the impact of COVID-19 and how we are preparing to be successful in the new normal, and then discuss the progress we have made with execution of the cost reduction program announced on March 30th. We entered the first quarter of 2020 with positive momentum as we built a foundational group of large, influential hospitals and health systems who have begun utilizing the PureView system. The feedback from these early adopter hospitals has continued to be very positive, further confirming what we believe is the value that our system offers GIs in providing improved patient care while also reducing hospital costs and increasing efficiencies as it relates to inpatient colonoscopies. Our launch of the PureView system into the U.S. market is focused on accomplishing four key objectives generating demand at target institutions in leading hospital networks, developing value assessment committee approval for the PureView system at these targeted institutions, driving utilization at top national health systems that can influence the market, and building brand awareness of the value that PureView technology provides as a solution in busy hospital GI labs. I am pleased to report we are executing it against each of these four objectives, though at a pace that reflects the current market conditions. As we discussed on our last call at the end of March, our progress was hindered in the back half of the first quarter as the COVID-19 pandemic gained momentum and severely constrained our customers' ability to perform colonoscopies using PureView, pursue new product evaluations, or commit to new equipment investments. As the threat of COVID-19 became a clear and more pronounced, and in order to ensure the health and safety of our employees and customers, we complied with CDC guidelines and enacted social distancing, thereby requiring our sales team to work from home. Despite these challenges, we have gained approval and placement of the PureView system in 19 major hospitals since our Q4 2019 launch. These prestigious hospitals include several of the top-ranked GI centers in the United States, including the Cleveland Clinic, UCLA, the University of Texas, 
Geisinger Medical Center, and Memorial Hermann Health System. Each of these hospitals continue to move through the sales process from evaluation to approval to building utilization, which typically ranges from four to six months. Despite losing part of the first quarter due to the COVID-19 lockdown, I am pleased to report that we've now trained more than 75 physician champions on the PureView system. We believe that hospitals will begin to reactivate broader elective and non-elective procedures towards the end of Q2, and that the COVID-19 crisis has the potential to amplify the important role that PureView can have on assisting sites as their GI labs begin to ramp back up. As it relates to the significance of the unmet need in the market for our technology, we are encouraged by our ability to gain evaluation approvals as we approach accounts on our target list. We are batting 1,000 in VAC approvals so far and have been pleased by the economic, clinical, and overall utility acceptance of the PureView system. Although we have implemented a targeted downsizing as part of our previously announced cost reduction program, we continue to build a strong pipeline of pending evaluations. Of particular note are a number of significant um, upcoming evaluations, including the Mayo Clinic, UC Irvine, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and Northwestern University Medical Center. We currently anticipate these evaluations to begin during June and July. During the last few months, we've maintained a high level of communication with our GI champions, despite the impact that COVID-19 has had on their departments. Most of their hospitals have been fully dedicated to addressing COVID-19 patients, limiting other activities in order to keep non-COVID-19 patients safely out of the hospital. While inpatient colonoscopies typically are not an elective procedure, we have seen a meaningful reduction in cases at most sites. It is our understanding that patients not exhibiting severe active bleeding at the hospital have had their procedures postponed as the hospitals wait for the COVID-19 cases to plateau. With the unusual and extended lull in GI procedures, resulting in many physicians working from home, it has afforded us the opportunity to spend more time with them discussing the advantages that the PureView system can provide when they return to some degree of normalcy in the coming months. GIs have informed us that they expect, at least initially, to be treating a larger than usual number of sick patients as they begin to reactivate their departments. The largest concern we've heard has been the importance of avoiding any extended hospitalizations, canceled or aborted procedures due to insufficient bowel prep. We share in their concern and have amplified our messaging to remind them of our belief that the single largest benefit of the PureView system is to allow for a successful procedure the first time through. This is just one example of how we are approaching hospitals as a value-added partner offering a solution with the potential for high impact as they adapt to a new normal. I have made it a directive for our commercial team to not wait for the GIs and hospitals to lead the way, but instead I expect the MODIS GI team to be proactive and find solutions for our hospital customers as their activities begin to ramp back up. Let me share a few new initiatives we've enacted and are beginning now to roll out. As a result of access to on-site visits being limited or not available, we have initiated a virtual support program for inpatient procedures. This program can become a valuable tool for us, and GIs have expressed their appreciation for this level of flexibility. As part of our virtual support, we just launched a new mobile app that is now available on both iOS and Android devices. This app provides chaptered and narrated video support that covers the setup and use of the PureView system. As in-person meetings for discussions about the PureView system with new target hospitals are currently not possible, we have established a virtual PureView training room that is manned five days a week, eight hours a day, based on our Florida facility, where live system demonstrations and in-services are available utilizing real-time video technology. We are also evaluating the idea of providing off-site training to GIs and their staff on the PureView system with the goal to conduct this training in either an ambulatory center or a nearby hospital 
where it may be a safer and more convenient environment. We believe we have an opportunity to position PeerView as an even more valuable tool in the GI suite as hospitals proactively consider how to improve patient flow and eliminate the costly burden of extended hospitalizations. Looking outside the U.S., we recently announced receiving CE Mark approval in Europe as well as Israeli approval for the second generation PureView system. We are also actively evaluating potential strategic partnership opportunities with established medical device companies and distributors that have a global commercial footprint and scale. While Europe and Asia are both interesting markets for partnership, we also continue to evaluate potential opportunities to accelerate our launch in the U.S. market should the right opportunity present itself. In terms of the cost reduction program we announced on March 30th, I am pleased to tell you that the team has rallied together to execute this plan in rapid fashion. We are confident that we will achieve our objective of reducing our quarterly cash burn by approximately 50% or approximately $3 million per quarter beginning on July 1, 2020. This program was designed to allow us to successfully navigate the uncertainties of the market during this unprecedented time while continuing to advance our commercial and strategic objectives. Before I turn the call over to Andrew, let me summarize our recent accomplishments. We continue to make steady progress against our commercial objective of generating demand, most importantly by building a solid foundation of key reference centers and KOL support across the U.S. We have decisively adjusted to the new environment created by the COVID-19 pandemic and are prepared to continue to access the market with an innovative approach. And finally, we have taken the necessary steps to ensure financial stability for the company during these times. I will now turn the call over to Andrew to discuss our first quarter financials. Andrew? Thank you, Tim. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We reported revenue for the first quarter of approximately $28,000 from sales of the PureView single-use suite. As Tim discussed, we continue to gain new system placements and increase our training of GIs early in the quarter prior to the impact of COVID-19. The majority of these centers were operating under an evaluation period during which several were paying for disposables but not the PureView workstation. We continue to work through capital equipment purchases, leases, or rentals with many of these accounts. For the three months ended March 31, 2020, we reported a net loss of approximately $6.5 million, or a net loss per diluted share of 23 cents, compared to $6.3 million, or a net loss per diluted share of 29 cents for the same period last year. The first quarter of 2020 included non-cash expenses of approximately $600,000 principally related to stock-based compensation, compared to $1 million of non-cash expenses for the same period of 2019. As was the case in the first quarter of 2019, the company's cash flows from operating activities this period included certain one-time annual expenditures related to personnel, insurance, and other compliance fees. The amount of these specific cash outflows totaled approximately $1.6 million. With respect to our cost-cutting measures, as Tim mentioned, these are tracking to plan and are expected to largely be implemented by the end of the second quarter, resulting in a significantly reduced cash burn run rate on a go-forward basis. We continue to estimate that total one-time charges associated with this program will be in the $1 million to $1.5 million range. At the end of the first quarter, we expensed approximately $600,000 as a portion of these charges. We held approximately $21.5 million in cash and cash equivalents as of March 31, 2020. Additionally, we recently entered into a deferral agreement with Silicon Valley Bank whereby our term loan was extended by six months to June 2024, with the interest-only period now in place through June 2022, 
providing additional financial flexibility to the company. And with that, I'll now turn the call back over to Tim. Thank you, Andrew. In closing, we are pleased with how our sales team continues to find innovative ways to effectively stay engaged with our target GIs and hospitals during the COVID-19 pandemic. We see an opportunity to engage additional GIs and train them on the PureView system while they work through this unique slowdown in their hospitals. And we are working with hospitals and GIs to plan for ramping up inpatient colonoscopies with an influx of at-risk patients who have had their procedures delayed and would benefit from the PureView system. We've created a compelling technology that addresses a large procedural market. We've established first mover advantage and are pleased with the positive impact we believe we can have as it relates to improving patient care and health economics, particularly in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. I will now ask the operator to open the call for questions. Thank you. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Our first question comes from the line of Stephen Lichtman with Oppenheimer. Please proceed with your question. Hi, thanks. Um, Tim, you mentioned um, the, uh, the the emergent uh, active bleeding patients, you know, not getting deferred certainly as much as others. You know, what percent of the inpatient col- uh, colonoscopies would you estimate fall in into sort of that category? So, so uh, Steve, thanks for the question. Um, let me let me start by just saying, in general, um, what we've seen in talking to our physicians is um, in many cases their overall colonoscopy volume has been down by upwards of uh, anywhere between 75 and 85 percent during this uh, this period of time. Um, that said, you know, as you know, we focus on critical colonoscopies, which um, if you look at the total colonoscopy procedure for inpatients, roughly about 60 percent of those are a bleed. Um, What we've seen, though, you know, so you you kind of scratch your head and say, okay, well, you know, these patients still exist. Um, But in talking to our physicians, what they've told us is due to the redeployment of many of their units to treat COVID patients, um, they've basically assessed these patients, and if their bleed was not significant, they've actually postponed them either to an outpatient center um, or postponed the procedure uh, uh, to take place at a later date. So um, they've changed their protocols as it relates to managing um, even these critical colonoscopies that they typically wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have discharged. Okay, got it. Um, and then uh, you, uh, in, in just the last few weeks, you, you've continued to build out the pipeline. Can, can you remind us, you know, how you define um, a, a pipeline opportunity, you know, as you, as you put a new hospital in that bucket? Sure. Yeah, so, um, you know, in my mind, the general pipeline are, you know, accounts that we've targeted and we've had some degree of interaction with. And if you look at that universe, um, Steve, it's about 150 hospitals. But then from there, you know, we prioritize based on um, the profile that we think best meets our strategic objective as well as where those hospitals are in terms of their ability to prioritize the evaluation um, of the MODIS product. So um, I would say that uh, we probably have about 60 accounts that um, are in our backlog, um, and we continue now to just add those um, as we move forward. So as I mentioned in my, um, my earlier remarks, um, we've been cultivating these opportunities at places like Mayo Clinic and Northwestern. Um, we added a couple new ones um, that I don't think we've talked about before, but UPMC, which, as you know, is a very large system, you know, that we've been in dialogue with, and now we have approval to move forward with an evaluation, um, as well as the Methodist system in Houston. So we continue to take them from, you know, initial contact, discussion with GIs, to approval, actually, through their VAC to do an evaluation. And those are the ones that we really focus on as it relates to pipeline accounts. Got it. Okay. And then just last one, I'll jump back in queue. Um, 
How many of the, the 19 hospitals where you've placed peer review, uh, how many of those have gone through a, a full VAC at, at this point? Yeah, sure. Great question. So, you know, what we found in most of the processes are there's an initial VAC approval required to do an evaluation and bring the the equipment on site, um, and every one, obviously, of those accounts have gone through that. Um, I would say, generally speaking, about half of those accounts have gone through the full VAC approval, and as I alluded to earlier, so far we've received that approval um, in each of those. Um, what I will what I will note is um, in most of those cases now they're starting to purchase the disposable sleeves. We are still working through uh, the capital process, as you know. You know the capital funding is not always available at the time of VAC approval, um, but hopefully that uh, that gives you a little bit more color, Steve, on the on on the conversions. Yep, that's helpful. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Jeffrey Cohen with Ladenburg Salmon. Please proceed with your question. Hi, this is actually Destiny on for Jeff. Um, thank you for taking the question. Um, I just real quick wanted to confirm that we would see approximately half a million to um, one million in one-time charges in Q2 related to the um, COVID expense reductions. Am I understanding that correctly? So, yeah, so we had outlined um, that, that we expected the total charge to be anywhere between $1 million and $1.5 million. Um, I would say right now, Destiny, that we will come in on the low end of that range. Okay, perfect. Thank you for clarifying. Um, and yeah, and just, to, just to clarify to... that one point, sorry, just to uh, close sure. the loop, there was about 600000 uh associated with the one-time charges that was uh, booked in Q1 of that range, so it's right. not incremental. Okay. Just one. Okay, to... got it. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and then I also just wanted to touch on inventory levels. I'm wondering what they may look like for the remainder of the year. I know you mentioned briefly in your press release, so I'm wondering um, if it'll be similar to Q1 or slightly above. Sure. Um, let me just make a, a kind of a color commentary on that first, Destiny. Um, you know, as we looked at um, what was happening with the impact of COVID and, you know, the expected slowdown in these facilities, um, and as part of our cost reduction program, you know, we made sure that we were running the, bis the business as efficiently um, as possible, um, and uh, but also balancing to ensure that we have enough inventory to meet our needs. I will tell you that we're very comfortable um, that we have the appropriate number of uh, both workstations as well as disposables, both slim and adult, um, to meet both the existing needs but uh, upcoming in terms of what we expect in terms of conversions at new facilities. Um, Mark, if you want to just chime in with a little bit more detail as it relates uh, to that, um, please feel free. Thanks, Tim. No, I think I think you said it well. I think we're in a very good position from an inventory perspective, um, and you know we have uh, extending a uh, good shelf life on our product, so that uh, you know with any ups and downs that happened, uh, you know we should be in a very good position, and we have no really no concerns at all from a supply chain perspective. Okay, got it. Thank you. And then I'm just curious for your virtual programs, um, what kind of mix are you seeing as far as attendees? Are you seeing um, you know, physicians that have been using it and are looking to, you know, get a better, like, understanding and additional training, or are you seeing more um, pipeline accounts? And then are you also considering maintaining these virtual options for physicians? I know we've, we've talked to a number of companies that have been doing that. Yeah. Yeah, Destiny, um, it, that's actually, it's really exciting um, the way I look at this. You know, we've really digitized, if you will, our go-to-market model, um, and some of this was in the works prior to COVID. You know, one of the things that we've always looked at with this, with this business is over time, um, getting uh, hospitals self-sufficient on doing the peer view, peer view procedure. Once we've come in and done all the training and are no longer at the site on a daily basis, you know, you want to be able to provide the appropriate tools to, to allow them to, uh, to do cases without us there. So, um, what I would say is the silver lining here with COVID is it accelerated, 
you know, our time and effort in these areas. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have um, been, as you'd imagine, utilizing some of the standard tools like Zoom and webinars. Um, we also created this virtual training room, which I think um, is going to be very interesting, uh, where you can call in and, you know, see a live demonstration without having to, you know, have a sales rep there. Um, I talked about the app, um, which we've gotten tremendous early feedback on what we've put into that app in terms of content and the, and the fact that um, you can go through an in-service on the device, but we've chaptered it with commentary. Um, so if there's just one part of the system set up, you know, or, or disposable removal at the end that you want to remind yourself or get a refresher on, you can go right to that section and just watch a, you know, call it 30-minute clip. There's a few other things that we hadn't mentioned, um, but we have a, a, a new whiteboard animation um, tool that's going to be launched here in the next two weeks. Um, and this really outlines um, the importance of the system, how it's utilized, and some specific case studies that we think is going to get good attention um, both at the hospital level um, but also in social media. So there's a lot of these things that um, they're now ready and they're, they're, they're starting to be utilized in the market. Um, we will absolutely continue to support this and I would say even add to it over time. Um, in terms of where we've targeted this, you know, as I look at our business right now, um, and I've said this before, the pipeline, um, because of this unmet need and because of the fact that we are the only uh, technology in the market c that can meet this need, um, we have not had a difficult time getting interest and having facilities want to do an evaluation. So we're focused now on going, you know, a bit deeper um, before we go wider, if you will. So the focus of a lot of this um, remote work has been on existing customers, trying to get them through the remainder of the sales process. Process, um, as well as the um, immediate kind of on the cusp customers. So these are facilities that either have our device on site and we're about to start a trial or, you know, had received approval for a trial and will be starting now in June and July. Um, we spent most of our time um, with those folks over the course of the last 60 days. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I'll jump back in queue. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from line of Ben Hainer with Alliance Global. Please proceed with your question. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thanks for taking the question. I just had one. You've uh, done a good job providing quite a bit of color so far. But you, you mentioned uh, the, um, you know, some of the, these uh, procedures being pushed to outpatient centers at the same time that you're seeing. Uh, you're seeing the length of stay improvements of PureView really resonate with these hospitals. I mean, do you worry at all that uh, some of these that are getting pushed out uh, to the outpatient centers, not just in time, um, ultimately do not come back to the hospital and maybe you need to shift uh, the commercialization strategy uh, more towards uh, outpatient centers or, or any color you could provide there would be helpful? Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, I would say that, you know, and we've talked to a large number of our docs, um, one of the benefits, you know, in, in this period of time has been a lot of the GIs have been working from home. Um, so our ability to interact with them on a much more routine basis has been, has been you know, remarkably high. Um, I would say that the majority of these cases have been postponed as opposed to have been picked up um, in, in the outpatient center. Um, I think if it was significant and they were able to do it, they, they did. Um, but what we're hearing from our docs is they're expecting um, a significant influx of these sicker patients as they start to ramp back up. Um, and what they've, what they've basically told us, and, and um, we've now shared or we've put some of our existing guys in touch with, you know, docs that haven't had uh, exposure to the technology yet to share, which is, you know, the, the number one thing that they want to do with these patients is ensure that um, if they're bringing them into a hospital environment, you know, and if you think about the COVID testing that has to be done, the PPE that's going to be consumed by both the healthcare professionals as well as the patient, um, and the fact that there's a risk. There's always going to be a risk there that that patient can catch the virus while they're there. The last thing that they want to do is have that procedure be prolonged or canceled. Um, so uh, the feedback we've received is the value prop will likely be even um, more important now, you know, post-COVID and with the awareness on the importance of, you know, length of stay reduction. So, you know, we really think that this um, this works well in terms of, you know, what we've been talking to the market about uh, even before COVID hit. Okay. That, that's definitely helpful. And actually, just one more quick one for me. Uh, you mentioned the strategic partnership opportunities and, and uh 
uh, the potential to maybe uh, sign a, an agreement here for the U.S. market. You know, any color you can provide on, you know, how those discussions ha- have been going, you know, whether you think that that uh, is a likely route, uh, you know, anything, any help there would be would be great. Sure. Yeah, you, listen, there's, there's only so much, as you know, Ben, that um, that I can comment on now. But what I will say, just generally speaking, is um, I'm very pleased with the interest and attention um, that we've gotten in the market with our with our uh, product. You know, I think it's being recognized by other um, folks that uh, either play directly in this space or uh, in a nearby, you know, part of the hospital and look to try to get into the GI space. I think they see that we've got a technology that's taken us, you know, eight or nine years to really perfect um, that allows a physician to control uh, a procedure that is is um, today very much un- uh, not controlled well and is costly to hospitals. We also have first mover advantage. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, We've protected this asset. You know, we think it's going to be quite some time before someone um, is in the market competing with us. You know, I think that's gotten the attention of some of these um, larger companies. So we continue to be in active dialogue. Um, it, when there's an update, of course, I will uh, I will provide that. Um, but right now, you know, we're really focused um, uh, on continuing to bring these large centers on board, which I think just gives us, you know, um, more leverage as we move forward and, and continue to have these discussions. Okay, very helpful. And th- thanks for taking the questions and uh, keep up that batting average for the VAC approvals. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Matthew O'Brien with Piper Sandler. Please proceed with your question. Uh, afternoon. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, of those 75 docs you've trained, are they all at those 19 facilities where you have a system, or are there some that are outside of those 19? Um, so, Matt, I would say the majority are at the sites that we have a system. Um, there's there's uh, there's a few that um, you know we have uh, we have spent a little bit of time with that um, you know they were we have because we have loaner units that we um, give to our reps that they can go out and do some training. So when they're you know um, creating interest in the market, um, they they may have go have a meeting and they'll train a physician on how to utilize the device. But if they're not ready to trial, then obviously we're not going to leave it on site. But I would say the large majority are at the facilities that that we're working with today. Okay. And then, you know, Tim, as we think about things as they progress throughout the course of the year, I mean, you know, capital is definitely constrained at a lot of these hospitals. They have a lot of other things to to worry about at the moment. You know, they're hemorrhaging money, at the, at, you know, currently. So how do you think about the recovery here for you guys? you know, during the back half of the year, or is it is it going to be really difficult until we probably get into 21 and things have, have moderated more so? Or can you be more flexible with your uh, your uh, business model? Yeah. Yeah, so as you know, um, Matt, and we've talked about this, I mean, capital, capital has kind of always been tight, and I think it just got, you know, a bit tighter, in, at least in, in areas that have been hit the hardest. And, and we've heard that feedback. Um, in, in particular, even with some of our existing accounts that, you know, we're on the cusp of releasing funds to uh, purchase the workstation, and now that's been put on hold, at least temporarily. Um, but what I will say is um, I think we have the flexibility to um, really partner with these sites and be creative in terms of how we structure um, our programs, and we've already had some of those discussions, you know, and there's things, and we'll, we'll talk in more detail as they uh, are actually enacted, but, you know, volume-based agreements. Um, where some sites have said, hey, we can make a commitment on the number of procedures we'll do, but there may, we may not be able to, you know, pay for the capital now, you know. And in our mind, and I've said this before, um, the capital has value, of course. Um, however, getting these sites to the point where they are doing repeat procedures, we're getting repeat disposable orders, and, and our product has become just a standard tool you know, in their toolbox within the GI lab um, is really where we need to be and what we're focused on. So, you know, we will not let capital um, slow down these conversions, um, but we think we can get creative as it relates to, um, you know, the way we go about the partnership and, and including the disposables. Okay, thanks. And then one for Andrew, just, you know, the, the level of cut is definitely necessary given what's going on. Can you talk about where you know, the majority of those cuts are really focused on and and then how that could impact you as you head into 21 as far as trying to grow the business? 
I'll come on, I'll comment uh, generally, and I'll I'll hand it over to to Tim to talk about uh, sort yeah. of general impact on uh, strategy and and our commercial objectives. But the the short answer, um, Matt, is really across the board. Um, you know, as we talked about last quarter, uh, we had some. Uh, cuts in the commercial department a little bit more than than 50 percent in that regard and then in other areas uh, it was anywhere between you know 30 to 50 percent really across the board uh, and Tim if you want to comment on sort of how that sets us up uh, for the remainder of the year and into 21. Yeah um, what I'll say is uh, one of the most important things when we made that decision um, was we want it to be decisive. We want to ensure that it was meaningful enough to allow us to weather the storm, um, to get through this period of time, you know, and the unknowns in terms of when hospitals would start to get back online. Um, and we also, uh, you know, one of the kind of tenets of the, the, the process was we, we didn't want this to be ongoing. So um, doing the best of our ability to ensure that there wouldn't be additional cuts. And right now I, I feel comfortable, you know, with the, at least the view that we have that's getting a little clearer that there, there wouldn't be additional cuts. Um, what we did do, though, is, Matt, is we looked at the overall organization and, you know, we trimmed in areas where um, we may be placing a bet that's much longer uh, term. Um, and we said, okay, does this meet our Im immediate objectives? And, you know, the number one immediate objective for Modus GI is demand generation in the market uh, commercially with our product, building out that foundational group of hospitals that then, you know, really become the proxy for what this market can be. You know, uh, either as we add back more salespeople and grow that business ourselves, or we look at a strategic partnership. Um, I think that's the critical priority. The other um, key objective, you know, that we thought about when we made the cuts were, you know, the technical expertise of the company, ensuring that we can drive um, some of the opportunities that we see that are in the nearer term. So, you know, next generation um, ideas around our disposable sleeve, which have been in the works, as well as the uh, the upper GI opportunity that we talked about in last call. Um, so we made sure that we didn't impact those key priorities. Priorities, um, but we did have to make some hard decisions um, on things that you know we can uh, we can add back uh, you know as we see things getting getting a little bit more positive in the market. Um, but I feel very comfortable that um, that we're able to achieve the most important objectives. Uh, so hopefully that that makes sense. And you know if you look around the market, and I've heard from you know colleagues and others that have had to um, you know make you know much worse decisions you know and some that. You know, are questioning whether they can weather the storm, and I'm I'm really pleased that we took you know quick action in terms of what we did. Okay, and just quick follow up on that, Tim. How many sales reps do you have at the moment? And how are you thinking about the end of the year? Yeah, so we um as I I think I mentioned this on the last call, we made about a 50 percent reduction um, in terms of uh, our headcount. Um, so roughly, Matt, um, we have five uh, customer facing uh, field people. Um, and we've really um, focused them on, you know, central, west, and east um, with our key relationships in many of those sites. Um, we also have um, support in Texas um, where we've got some good installations of product and, of course, our, our head of sales. So um, that, that's the way the commercial team is structured now. Um, and then in terms of uh, uh, marketing and, and um, you know, the other su key support areas, um, you know, we, we've, we've peeled off a few folks, but we've kept uh, our key employees there. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Kyle Bowser with Doherty and Company. Please proceed with your question. Hi, Tim and Andrew. Thanks for the updates here and taking the questions. Um, I know, uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's more important now than ever to get the colonoscopy done in the inpatient setting on the first try, and, and I understand that even these non-elective inpatient colonoscopies are, are being pushed out, so um, it's hard to get into the new hospitals, but given the size of the early adopting hospitals, it seemed like um, the, the sales reps could stay quite busy making sure all the GI docs and support staff have been in-serviced and trained in. Um, so if you, as you look at these 19 hospitals with Gen 2, just kind of curious roughly what percentage of the targeted clinicians at these hospitals have been trained in. Yeah, Kyle, that's a good question. And, and um, 
we, we, as I mentioned earlier, we, we kind of had the luxury of um, many of these physicians working at home. Um, so we've been able to be in contact, and I would say with almost every one of those facilities, the key GI champions um, that, you know, either are, are docs that from the earlier accounts, places like UCLA, um, that are doing, you know, procedures on a regular basis, University of Texas, they're doing, you know, doing and purchasing sleeves on a regular basis, you know, we've been able to be back in touch with them just to, you know, check in, but on the facilities that were in the midst of an evaluation or the ones that had not yet started their evaluations, um, we've been in touch with, um, I can say confidently, all of those docs to ensure that we're walking through questions on the, the system, um, talking to their staff about setup. Um, and also even working through, you know, the anticipation of the value analysis committee, ensuring that we've got the data um, necessary to uh, have that be an efficient process once we get back on track. So um, overall, you know, this has been, um, in my mind, a pretty effective period of time um, in terms of, uh, you know, we've got a reduced size team, but you can get a lot done when people are available and we're doing things over the phone, um, if you think about it kind of from that perspective. And, you know, we even had procedures that were taking place in one of our evaluation sites, uh, Sinai Hospital in Baltimore, um, that did, uh, you know, seven, eight procedures this past month without us there, and we, and we were able to support them remotely, and they're in an early evaluation account, so that was very, very positive. Interesting. That's helpful. Uh, and, and can you talk about the rental process timeline? It sounds like there's flexibility here with accounts willing to do, you know, sort of minimum disposable volumes, but... Um, how long are you offering the, the rental option to accounts once they sign up, typically? So, you know, the priority is um, trying to get um, these facilities onto um, some type of capital program, whether it be, you know, an outright purchase, a rental, or a lease, um, or a different, you know, creative volume-based program, you know, really right uh, following the VAC approval. Now, um, at times, that is not uh, able to be done, you know, depending on the dynamics of the hospital. Um, so we've had instances where, you know, we've committed to say, okay, based on the volume that you're going to give us on a monthly and quarterly basis, you know, we will leave the workstation here for the next three months. Um, but at that point, we now need to try to get you under some type of an agreement. So we've shown that kind of flexibility. Um, and, you know, keep in mind it's early, right? We're, uh, call it, uh, we're two quarters into our, our, our launch, you know, of which a month, you know, was impacted. So these, most of these facilities that we talked about are, you know, really getting through the final portion of their process. So a lot dialogue in terms of, you know, the timing of when they will move to a rental is, is really happening real time, if you will. Got it. And, and then just, just lastly, I know the clinical trials across the board have largely been put on hold, but can you just uh, walk through in a little bit more detail the plans for each of your upcoming and, and ongoing studies that we should keep an eye on? Yeah, sure. Let me um, make a, a general comment. So, yes, um, they've all been uh, impacted, you know, just as, as everyone else in the market has seen in terms of clinical study activity. Um, you know, you know that we're running the expedite study in Boston, and, of course, Boston has, um, you know, had a, a large number of cases, and we've been in very close contact with, with Dr. Jacobson, um, and uh, they are not um, really back yet up and running as it relates to the clinical study, but we continue to stay in close contact. Um, as you know, um, we are also focused on, um, you know, as you think about 2020, uh, and we've said this, the investments that we want to make around um, clinical studies are all to advance our commercialization efforts. So we haven't yet revealed um, the details, um, and we will when, when, when the time is, uh, when, it, when these are approved, but we are working with a couple of the largest centers in the U.S. to construct studies that will give us, um, you know, additional data that we don't have today, you know, around GI bleeding and the, uh, the economics associated with using PureView for the GI bleeds. So, you know, we've talked about um, getting into a GI bleeder with a, a reduced uh, uh, timeline, you know, and some physicians have already done that with very minimal prep. So we'd like to formalize that, and we're working with some of the largest centers um, to do that. Um, I can ask Mark if you'd like to provide a little bit more color, uh, you know, as it relates to clinicals. Uh, please, please add. Yeah, I, think, I think you covered it well, Tim. You know, uh, you know to Tim's point, Kyle, uh, we're really, you know, looking at, you know, those critical patients and, and developing more data 
you know, around that. So, you know, everyone's already fairly aware that, you know, we don't want to delay patients and the COVID uh, issues have only accentuated that. So really driving to that whole point of, you know, especially for those critical bleeds, uh, you know, not even waiting, you know, overnight to try to prep those patients, uh, but really to try to move that to, a, you know, a much more rapid colonoscopy experience, you know, to really not only for the economic benefits, but could also have the uh, large potential to show some significant clinical benefits as well. Got it. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Tim and Andrew. Appreciate the updates here. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Yi Chen with H.G. Wainwright. Please proceed with your question. Hi, this is Bubalan dialing in for H.G. Um, I have a couple of questions. So I, I just wanted to make sure uh, the rescue study you have not initiated, correct? I mean, um, do, do you have any plans when you plan to initiate that? Um, um, are you planning to use the study data for any future indication expansion or some sort of special site and key clearance? Can, can you just repeat the first part of the question? Which study are you uh, referring to? Rescue study. Rescue. Oh, the, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. It was cutting out the rescue study. Uh, Mark, do you, do you want to provide a little bit of color as it relates to the rescue? Sure. So yeah, the uh, the rescue study. You know, we have currently uh, put on hold, which is more of a of an outpatient uh, focused. Study, and you know that study we're going to determine, you know, probably uh, as we get later into the year, depending on how uh, things begin to open up, whether that's an area that we want to uh, focus on. That was not a study to help with any indication expansion or any claims or any regulatory process. That was more just for uh, for market development reasons uh, into the uh, you know eventually into that outpatient um, setting. So not a critical study for us you know, in the shorter term, you know, more for a longer term focus. And so we'll pick that up at the at the appropriate time, you know, and may even redesign it based on, you know, what we're seeing happening in the uh, in the COVID world. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so how do the sales of the Pure View over sleeve look like in 2020 before and after the peak impact? Maybe you can give some numbers. And also, do you have any expectations or guidance for the rest of the year with respect to the pure view, please. Sure, yeah, so so at this point we, we have not um, given guidance um, as it relates to revenues, um, you know, nor have we, you know, obviously then broke out the sales mix, um, but what I can tell you just to, you know, provide a little bit of color, um, and we've, we've said this publicly before, you know, what we expect initially um, when an account makes a conversion to pure view, we typically have two to three physicians that are our GI champions um, in that site that, you know, would have been part of the evaluation process and part of supporting the VAC approval, you know, with their clinical feedback. We expect those early accounts to ramp um, up to somewhere between five and ten procedures per month initially. And then over time, you know, as we continue to expand at that site, you know, what we do is we focus on bringing additional physicians in, um, have them trained, and then obviously that drives, you know, increased sleeve volume. But in terms of modeling, you know, when we put out detail, I think two, two calls ago, um, we, had, we had talked about uh, five to ten procedures per month initially is what, you know, we would expect that these sites can get to. Um, and then if you think just kind of longer term um, and at a macro level, um, there's about a million and a half procedures done each year in U.S. hospitals. Uh, these are the critical inpatient procedures. So about a million and a half procedures, and the literature has shown and we've seen in, in the real world that, you know, upwards of 50 to 55 percent of these procedures are indeed delayed for a night or two, you know, which is the perfect target opportunity for us um, here as we are, are, are launching the product um, to go after. So, you know, call that 750 to 800,000 procedures in the U.S. that immediately um, are our target market for us. And then, you know, of course, as you model things over the course of the next couple of years, you, you know, you can look at, you know, various penetration rates, but we, we think it's premature to, um, you know, provide specific revenue guidance until we get, you know, a couple more quarters under our belt. Great. Uh, just one final question. Uh, assuming the pandemic continues for the rest of the year, what are some of the steps you might have to take to protect your business? 
Yeah, so I think, you know, um, largely um, the, 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 the the big step that we've taken already, you know, as, as you are aware, um, on March 30th we announced the cost reduction program. We just talked about that. You know, I think taking, you know, half of our burnout um, of the quarter on a go-forward basis um, gives us uh, more runway um, to uh, hopefully allow things to uh, get a little bit, um, uh, you know, more um, – concrete in the market. Um, I am pleased that, you know, we're starting to see, if you look at the concentration of our accounts, um, we've got a, a large number of facilities that we have been working with in California. Um, we've got a nice in group of, of installations in Texas um, and also parts of the Midwest. And, and in speaking to those accounts over the last couple of weeks, it looks like the majority of those will start to get back up and running here in the first half of June. Um, I think some of our facilities in, you know, the Northeast, New York, Boston, um, some of the larger cities like Chicago may be a little bit later in the year. But we're anticipating that these um, facilities are going to start to get back up to uh, their normal volume over time. We've even had a few of the larger centers telling us that they're expecting by July to potentially be at 120% of their volume as they bring back this influx of patients. So, um, you know, we're expecting that things are going to get uh, better as we get, you know, into the summer. Um, but I think we've stabilized things from a financial perspective. We do, of course, you know, continue to have dialogue as, as we discussed with strategic uh, partners, both on the commercialization side, but also on the financial side in terms of, you know, um, uh, folks that understand our story and could be financial partners in the future for us. So, you know, right now I think it's all about execution, um, and, you know, we're hopeful that uh, the signs that we're seeing in some, some parts of the states are, are, are going to continue and, and we can get back, you know, on the trajectory that we were on before COVID hit. Okay. That's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our question and answer session. I'll turn the floor back to Mr. Moran for any final comments. Great. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank everyone for their time today, for the uh, continued interest in MODIS. Um, you know, we've got an incredible uh, technology that we are, you know, really in the early phases of, of developing into the market. Um, but when you look at this this procedural market, our first mover advantage, you know, and the states that uh, in just two quarters we're able to get our product into, uh, we remain very bullish uh, about uh, about the overall uh, future opportunity of the company, and uh, we'll look forward to providing updates uh, next quarter. So thanks, everyone, for participating today. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.